First we harvest some sand and grow big pure crystals of silicon from it. We cut the silicon crystal into flat wafers. Each atom of silicon has four free electrons. The crystal is very orderly and every electron plays a role in its structure. No electron wants to move from their assigned positions. The crystal is an electric insulator. We could replace some of the silicon atoms with phosphorus. Phosphorus has five free electrons, so four of them fill up the same structure as before, and the extra one floats around with no purpose. This electron easily moves around. This phosphorus doped material is now an electric conductor. We also could replace some silicon atoms with boron. Boron has three free electrons. These fill up the original structure as best as they can, leaving behind an extra hole. Nearby electrons easily move around, taking turns filling the hole. This boron doped material is also an electric conductor. If we put the two materials together, the extra electrons from one fill the extra holes from the other, and the electrons in the middle don't want to move. Electrons do not easily flow across the middle. The combined setup is an electric insulator. We can create a sandwich with the two types of materials. Electricity cannot flow from one end to the other. The system is an electric insulator. If we float a metal plate in the middle and apply voltage between it and the wafer, electrons will want to move from the wafer to the plate. In trying to do so, some electrons accumulate on the surface of the wafer closest to the plate. Light charges repel, so this pushes away electrons on the other end. Eventually the wafer has too many electrons, and their combined repulsion prevent more from joining in the action. The plate is positively charged, and the wafer surface is negatively charged. Now there is a connected region between the two ends of the wafer that has free electrons floating around. Electrons easily move from one end to the other via the channel we created, so the system is now an electric conductor. This means we can make the system conductive whenever we want by applying voltage to the metal plate. We've just made a transistor. We can also achieve the same effect if we swap the materials around. This version is also an electric insulator by default, and also becomes conductive if we apply voltage. This version requires the voltage to be applied in the opposite direction, so that the wafer surface becomes positively charged, has extra electron holes, and therefore helps electrons flow from one end to the other. We can wire these two types of transistors in certain patterns to perform certain functions. The most basic are the Boolean logic functions. First we put a power rail and a ground rail in the circuit. We say a wire has value 1 if it's electrically connected to the power rail, and value 0 if it's electrically connected to the ground rail. We can create a circuit with one input wire and one output wire. We use one type of transistor for the top and the opposite type of transistor for the bottom. The transistors become electrically conductive or insulating depending on the voltages of the inputs. And we arrange the transistors carefully so that the power rail and the ground rail are never electrically connected to each other, since that would cause a short circuit. In this case, the output wire has value 1 if the input has value 0, and the output has value 0 if the input has value 1. This is the circuit for the not logic gate. We also can create a circuit with two inputs and one output, where the output has value 1 only if both inputs have value 1. This is called the AND gate. There is a similar circuit where the output has value 1 if either or both inputs have value 1. This is called the OR gate. This design can be extended to support more than two inputs. There are many other kinds of circuits, but the NOT, AND, and OR gates are the most well known. We can use logic gates to create functions. We use binary to represent the inputs and the outputs, and we represent our function as a table containing the expected answer for all possible inputs. There is a brute force strategy to implement any function with logic gates. For each row of the table where the output is 1, we use the NOT gate on the bits of the inputs that are required to be 0, and combine the bits with the AND gate so that the output is only 1 if the inputs follow the exact pattern listed in the row. We connect the outputs corresponding to these rows with the OR gate. Now the output precisely follows the expected answer in our table. If our function has more than one output bit, we just repeat this process for each output bit. Of course, this is a really inefficient way to create our function, but rest assured it is always possible to create our function with logic gates. We can loop the outputs of a logic circuit back and use them as inputs, creating recursion. If we cause a contradiction with this recursion, our circuit would chaotically flicker between many output values and won't be very useful, so we should be careful to keep the circuit stable. With this recursion technique, we can create a circuit called a latch, which stably memorizes one bit of information. We'll have two inputs that are used to change the stored bit of memory. 
and the value stored in memory persists even after the inputs are set back to zero. We can also create modules that evolve over time. We use various components, such as a miniature tuning fork made of quartz, to create an oscillating voltage wave. This is used to create a signal called the clock, which periodically switches its logical value between zero and one. We can use logic gates and latches to create a module that saves the value of an input wire to memory, but only precisely when the clock changes from zero to one. This module is called a flip-flop, and we use its output to represent the state of an evolving system. We can use multiple flip-flops to represent many bits of state, and wire them to the same clock so that the entire state updates in regular intervals. Now we use logic gates to decide the next state given the current state, and we loop the wires backwards so that the state will evolve over time according to our function. We can now create all kinds of modules by piecing together flip-flops and other logical functions. There are more efficient ways to build some components such as big blocks of memory, but we can use these components the same way regardless of how they're built. It's possible to make a specific chip for any task we want to do, but making a chip is expensive. We instead make a general purpose device called a CPU. The CPU is a complex machine built out of many interacting modules that are all synchronized with the clock. To make it work, we first create a separate piece of hardware called the main memory, which is filled with numerous bits of memory grouped into 8-bit pieces and ordered in a line. Each group of 8 bits has an address representing its location in the line. Inside the CPU, we create a number of smaller memories called registers, which temporarily hold data used for computations. We connect the CPU to the main memory with wires, and install a memory controller in the CPU, which lets it write data to main memory at a specific address, or read data from some memory address into a given register. There are also other circuits built into the CPU, and other wires in the CPU that let it interact with external hardware components. We control the CPU by telling it to execute instructions stored in memory. Each instruction can read data from memory into registers, modify the data inside registers, write data from registers back to memory, or manipulate the other components and wires in various ways. We choose a basic set of instructions that we want our CPU to support, and choose a binary representation for each instruction. Our list of instructions, also known as a program, is nothing more than a long string of bits stored somewhere in memory. One of the registers in the CPU is called the program counter. It stores the memory address of the CPU's current instructions. When the CPU runs, it acts in sync with the clock to move the program counter forward, read the instructions stored in memory, and perform the actions requested in the instructions. Some instructions involve changing the value inside the program counter, which lets the CPU skip forward or backward in a program. These instructions can be conditional, so that the program counter is only modified if certain conditions are met. These behaviors can be used to create branches where the CPU chooses one of two actions, or loops where the CPU performs a sequence of instructions multiple times. We now have a computing machine that is general purpose and programmable. We can make more complex CPUs which read and execute multiple instructions in parallel, maintain local caches for faster access to frequently used sections of memory, and predict very accurately how the program counter changes even in the presence of loops and branches. But these complex CPUs are still designed to conceptually behave as if they were running the instructions one at a time in the proper order. Any changes made to main memory are lost when the computer is powered off. It's possible to store long-lasting data in a separate piece of hardware called the persistent storage, which uses magnetization patterns or trapped electric charges to store bits of information. When the computer starts up, it executes a fixed sequence of instructions known as the bootloader, which tells the CPU to communicate with the persistent storage and load its data into main memory. This data includes instructions for what the CPU should do next, which make up a program called a kernel. The kernel uses some memory to keep track of a list of activities called processes. Each process owns a piece of memory, which contains a program as well as the data and working space needed by that program. The kernel will tell the CPU to execute the programs contained within these processes, and will use timer circuits built into the CPU to periodically switch between the processes. The register contents are saved and restored from memory every time the kernel switches processes, which allows each program to be paused and resumed without losing progress. The kernel is designed so that the processes have limited control over the CPU, 
preventing them from doing anything that will damage the kernel or other processes. The kernel will stop processes from overriding memory at addresses they do not own, or from using CPU circuits and wires in unapproved ways. Such supervision is usually achieved with specialized features offered by the CPU. If a process wants to do something special, such as communicating with external hardware devices, it can't do so by directly controlling the CPU. Instead, it needs to ask the kernel to do it on the process's behalf with a privileged procedure. Though the kernel takes many freedoms away, it offers many conveniences in return. The kernel can do some very complex work inside a privileged procedure, allowing the programs within the processes to achieve high-level goals without worrying about the hardware details. Some privileged procedures are built into the kernel. These are called system calls. Other privileged procedures can be added by registering them into the kernel through a device driver. We are now free to execute multiple programs as separate processes running under a single kernel. We can start by setting up processes to draw windows on a monitor and manage the keyboard and mouse. Now we have an operating system. Data can be stored as abstract concepts known as files. Processes can read and write files with ease. The kernel figures out all the hairy details of how to talk with the persistent storage. Programs can also be stored in files. The user of the computer may choose to execute any program they want by selecting the appropriate file with their mouse and telling the operating system to create a new process for their program. There is a very useful type of program called a compiler. It reads a file containing human-readable commands and converts them into the type of instructions used by the CPU, which can then be saved somewhere as an executable program. The human-readable commands, also known as computer code, are written in a standard format called a programming language. The language lets a programmer describe actions that are much more abstract than those of the CPU's native instructions. The compiler uses complicated procedures to interpret the computer code and find the most efficient sequence of native CPU instructions to achieve the desired effects. It's actually easiest to create the compiler itself with a programming language and a compiler. With some tricks, it's even possible to create a compiler using the very programming language it's designed to compile. We can compile a specific program for every task we want to do, but compiling and saving these programs can be annoying. We can instead create a general purpose program called a runtime environment. The runtime environment already comes with a lot of built-in procedures, enough to cover anything its intended user might want to do. We control the runtime environment by telling it when and how to use its built-in procedures. We save the instructions in a file and tell the runtime environment to get its instructions from that file. Different runtime environments are specialized for different kinds of work, and will have different built-in procedures. The files containing the instructions are also written in standardized formats, which we call scripting languages. Many of these scripting languages are also described as being programming languages. There isn't a formal definition for what constitutes a programming language anyhow. Sometimes, we'll have a big group of people who all want to do similar tasks. These tasks can be pretty complex and might take a lot of computer code to implement, even if we used a good programming language. Instead of having everyone write computer code from scratch, we can have one person implement a big set of procedures and allow others to copy the computer code for their own uses. The shared computer code can form a library where people using the shared work can write their program however they like, sprinkling in the external procedures only when needed. Alternatively, the shared computer code can form a framework where people using the shared work are expected to exclusively use external procedures to build their entire program. These tools can be nested together to ridiculous ends. We can make a program using a framework whose code uses work from a dozen libraries, which themselves might rely on other libraries. These can all run on a runtime environment, which itself contains a compiler to help make commonly accessed parts of the program run more efficiently. Also, we almost always build applications out of multiple pieces of computer code. The application could be using a dozen processes to do its job. Heck, the application might even be distributed across a swarm of several thousand computers. Of course, to do basic software engineering work, you only really need to focus on the topmost layers of your system. If designed well, the lower layers will operate so smoothly that you will never need to think about them. But it probably would blow your mind to know how deep the rabbit hole goes.